I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed. Well, good morning and welcome back to Bible Talks. My name is Nick Greenman and I'm here with Chris Kramer and we are coming to you from WRUS here in Russellville at 9.05 on Saturday morning, unless you're listening to us on YouTube, which you can find this program uh, live uh, on YouTube at the same time of this recording uh, at 9.05 on YouTube. Uh, but if you can also look at some of our past uh, uh, programs as well that's been uploaded. And so today we're going to continue our study in Matthew chapter 5, looking at the Beatitudes. But before that, uh, just a, little, a few words of introduction. Uh, my name is Nick Greenman. I want to kind of take point this morning and appreciate the opportunity. Sorry for missing you guys last week, but yeah, our schedules just never could match up together. And I'm grateful to be able to be with y'all today. Uh, Thanksgiving was a blast. Got to see a lot of family. Um, and then, of course, this week, both Chris and I, we've been battling some sicknesses at home. Uh, but uh, Chris, uh, how have you been this week? Well, that's just the thing. I've been suffering with the flu. I've been in bed most of the week and was able to crawl out of bed and get cleaned up for the program today. Uh, so I probably won't be speaking as much as usual. Of course, preacher, preachers say that, but then they kind of go back on their words. So I, I, I can't promise anything, but uh, as long as my voice will hold out, we'll try to get in a good study this morning. Um, I, uh, I'm working with the Northside Congregation of the Church of Christ. Uh, We've been providing this program for so many years now. I've lost count. Uh, Brother Keith and a few other brethren started probably over 30 years ago. And uh, we're thankful to WRUS to give us this platform to study God's word. And uh, Nick and I have been going through the Beatitudes as we round up the year of 2021. So we can get into 2022 with a unique study about looking at each book of the Bible each week and uh, kind of doing a book review, if you will, kind of a book club kind of discussion. And I'm really looking forward to that. But these questions on the Beatitudes were uh, questions that were asked us by one of our brethren a few weeks ago about one in particular. And so we just decided we'd cover all of them. And today uh, we've reached um, the lesson about being merciful. And there's a lot there. And yeah. so, uh, Nick, go ahead and start us off and we'll get into our discussion. Yeah. Well, uh, you were saying that uh, uh, about having words to say as preachers, you know, we were yeah. trying to just talk about, you know, where we wanted to take this study today. And man, we were just really getting into some some fun stuff there. But uh, just taking a look at the passage there, uh, if y'all would just open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter five. Let us remind ourselves of what the text says there. And this is, of course, the Sermon on the Mountain. And this is the Beatitudes are just a, just a bunch of quick statements of attitudes that Christians should ought to possess and have the certain characteristics that we need to uh, have so that we can be uh, better aware of who we should be as Christians. And so there in, in verse seven, it says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. And, and when we look at the word blessed, just as quick reminder, it means that those who are happy, uh, there's a, a deep sense of joy when it comes to being a Christian. A lot of people seek to be happy in many different ways, but true happiness can only come when, when we have that, that peace of God, when we are like him, when we are really starting to mold our character to be, become the image of God. And so this is part of that process, is learning how to do some of these things. And when we learn about mercy, I mean, this is probably going to be one of the uh, most iconic, I guess you could say, because when we think about Christianity, it's that mercy of God that really begins to nail down what is it that, that we get when we decide to call upon the name of Christ? Why do we desire to be a Christian? Why do we forsake so much? It is because we realize that the loving God of all creation is so eager to forgive us of our sins that we can overcome so many of those negative things that we've done in our past. We can remove that guilt, remove that shame because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is the mercy of God. And we call it grace. And, and so we get to talk about that, not only from God's perspective today, but from our perspective, because look what it says. It says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Not only do we receive mercy, but in return, what should we be? We should be merciful. And, and so what we receive, we give. 
And so that's what we kind of want to talk about this morning. Well, what does this mercy look like? How do we express it? How can we share it? Because I tell you what, as human beings, we are so naturally uh, inclined just to seek revenge, right? When somebody offends us, messes with us, uh, hurts somebody, what are we quick to do? I mean, we're quick to fight back. If somebody attacks our family, man, we want to stand up and we want to fight them back, right? We, we, we have that just desire to seek revenge. And, and so we need to learn how to temper that. Uh, you know, we, we need to learn how to, to back off and, and take a step back and just kind of look at the situation, not be so quick to seek revenge. In the old law, it was eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But in the new law, right, we are taught to show mercy. If our enemy is hungry, we feed him. If our enemy is thirsty, we give him a drink. Let vengeance, uh, let that belong to God. And, and because he will avenge us, he will uh, pay back uh, to, to those who uh, attack us and offend us with his judgment. But we as Christians need to be that epitome. We need to be that example. We need to demonstrate the gift that they could receive through Christ if they humble themselves before him and, and are washed by his blood. And so it, that can begin with us. We can have that, that important first uh, contact with somebody right and we hear all the time that that first that first uh, uh, opinion or appearance uh, that 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 people will receive from you is going to be that hardest one to overcome if it's negative they're going to be thinking about you negatively for a long time that's a huge mountain to overcome and so sometimes that first opinion that people will uh, de uh, develop for God is how you treat that person and, and if you call yourself a Christian, there's like, well, I don't want to be a part of a God that has Christians like that. We might, you know, some people might overcome that by saying, well, that old person was just a hypocrite. But still, look how important it is uh, to demonstrate the character of God towards others, because that could become a huge stumbling block for them. And, and I'm sure most of you guys have been able to see a lot of that in your own life as well. Chris, you have any thoughts on that? Well, there are a lot of thoughts and, uh, you know, that's the problem with this topic like mercy. It can go so many different directions, but we're reminded that our God is a merciful God. And uh, a lot of people want to make a distinction that, you know, the God of the Old Testament is a little different than the God of the New Testament, but he's not. You know, yes, there was wrath. There were things that we see a direct relation to God's, uh, you know, judgment upon those that were defiant toward his word. And you find that in the New Testament as well. But all of it was to teach lessons of mercy. And um, we are, you know, teachers of a strict law, you might say. Uh, we teach obedience to Christ, you know, that we should strive for perfection. We should strive to do the best that we can in all things. But God never requires anything of us that he isn't willing to do himself. That's why he says, if you want mercy from me, you need to be merciful as well. Mm -hmm. You know, passage that comes to mind is later on in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, as we call it, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14. He said, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Mm -hmm. So it's always been a give and take. Because in that prayer that he offers as the model prayer, uh, what are we asking God for, for forgiveness? Mm. I know that that is a standard line in every single prayer for the most part that I've ever offered in my life. And, um, you know, what I look for is God's mercy. You know, there's a statement that that's made about mercy. Mercy is defined as, you know, not getting what we deserve. Now, is God a just God? Yes, he is the God of justice. Um, and he makes judgment upon me. And the truth of the matter is, if he were to be completely and strictly just regarding uh, my salvation, there's a pretty good chance I wouldn't make it to heaven. But because of his mercy, which is a part of his justice, we have to define justice in God's way. Because of his mercy, I can enjoy salvation. Um, you know, Nelson Mandela um, you know, was quoted as saying, you will achieve more in this world through acts of mercy than you will through acts of retribution. And, and that's basically showing how we need to behave as men. That, like you said, Nick, it's not about us taking vengeance. It's not about us paying back someone for what the wrongs they've done for us. It's about, and, and you really can't teach mercy without forgiveness. 
Hmm. Um, because the attributes of it are the same, the characteristics, the, the motivations of having a mercy towards somebody hinges upon our forgiving them. Yeah. Um, Abe Lincoln was quoted as saying, I've always found that mercy bears richer fruits than strict justice. Mm-hmm. Now, see, the problem that you get into, though, is people take a liberal view of that. And um, what, what I think a lot of people do is they say, well, you see, you know, strict justice doesn't matter. Uh, you know, we all uh, need to abide by the mercy of God. And because of his mercy, I'm going to heaven no matter what. And that's a, that's a very Calvinistic view of, of teaching the gospel. And looking at, yes, the blood of Christ is powerful. Yes, God's mercy is powerful. But he's not going to yank me into heaven in spite of myself. Um, He needs to see a determination. He needs to see a love. He needs to see that I'm merciful. And quite frankly, if, if one must practice mercy, that shows that mercy is conditional. It, it shows that God holds me to a certain standard in order that I can have mercy as well. So mercy isn't just across the board. You know, I'm going to forgive you no matter what. And I know that's what a lot of people love to teach. That's, I guess they take comfort in that, Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's still a standard that we need to live by. Yeah. And uh, what are some of your thoughts on that? Nick? Well, I I tell you, it's, it's a really interesting uh, concept here that, you know, we, we kind of take it for granted as Christians being able to forgive and offer mercy. That that that, that seems to be like just a natural thing. Uh, one because it it identifies the fact that you still have hope in humanity to be able to change and to be reconciled and be restored. I mean, uh, otherwise, then then why even give them a chance, right? But an interesting. Uh, philosophy, I guess you could call it, that I was not even quite aware of, or the dynamic of what Jesus is saying here, I wasn't quite aware of, until my wife introduced me to this woman. Uh, Her name is Ava Kaur. Uh, She was a twin, a Jewish little girl during the Nazi Holocaust. And if anybody knows what the twins had to go through during the Nazi Holocaust, then you can understand the agony and pain that this woman had to endure as a young child. Uh, But she was sent to one of the death camps there in Germany. Uh, Dr. Mangala, uh, he did these horrible tests on these twins, you know, because he had two pairs of identical genes and he could he could compare results with uh, awful, awful experiments. Uh, Well, Miss Tava, she died, I think, back in 19, uh, not 19, but 2019. Uh, and so she was running a museum up in uh, Indian, Indiana uh, to talk about everything that she had to go through and, and her experiences. I've uh, been able to go up there one day. But one of the things that she had to do in order to overcome this agony and this grief that she had to experience was she had to forgive Dr. Mangala. And her Jewish brethren revolted against her because forgiveness is is something that cannot be done from a human, only from God. And they said, what you're trying to do is blasphemy. What you're trying to do cannot be accomplished with, you know, we're supposed to, you know, I guess hold them accountable or something. There's a really cool documentary uh, that you can watch on that. And so my, my thoughts were, this is what Jesus was having to deal with when he was preaching this message there in the first century. Man, can you imagine the, the grading that must have been uh, on the, the philosophy of the Jews at the time? No. Who are you to be forgiving sins? Only God can forgive sins. That's what they say in Mark chapter 2 when he forgives the paralytic of his sins. And so there's like this really interesting dynamic that I had never even considered before. Like, is it impossible for the Jew to forgive somebody? And so, uh, you know, is there, are there mechanisms in the, in the law to forgive somebody who has offended you or who has a sin against you? I mean, obviously God can do that. And so uh, when Jesus is saying, hey, you know, you are to be merciful. You are to be forgiving. You forgive as you've been forgiven. Uh, you have mercy as you, you have been shown mercy. That is such a revolutionary idea at the time. And, and we take it for granted sometimes. Uh, and and so we need Christ to learn to, to appreciate because of that. 
Yeah, yeah. So we need to learn to appreciate that gift that we have so that we can understand that there is hope for restoration, that there is hope that we can overcome the sins of our past, overcome the, the guilt and the shame that once existed and say, hey, I'm a new person. I'm, I'm redefined. I'm remade. And, and I can change my future in spite of my past. Uh, and that's mercy. I see your point in all that, because what people often think is, well, price needs to be paid. You know, we need to pay our dues. We need to pay our price. Um, and uh, we put standards on that price. Well, what people aren't recognizing is that Jesus did pay the price. Uh, he paid the price of redemption so that we can be forgiven today. And that's why, you know, yeah, it's, it's not going to be based upon uh, my goodness. You know, we're saved because of God's mercy. We're not saved because of all the good works that we do. Does that mean we shouldn't do good works? No. I mean, he, mm-hmm. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10 defines that as having God's grace, his mercy through faith, that all these things are culminated in the fact that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that we should walk in. So we have a, we do have a, a duty there. Um, but this idea that mercy is just going to blanketly save you unfortunately like you pointed out the way that she was ostracized by her own people showed Mm -hmm. that people don't really believe that they still want justice right they still want retribution and um and that's why some of these great leaders that we talked about from the past i think had to publicly make statements like that because Mm -hmm. they saw the way man was treating one another without forgiveness or mercy uh, in their hearts and we can probably appreciate better now why Peter would ask, you know, Lord, if, if my brother sins against me seven times, how many times should I forgive him? <laughs> you know, there you go. Yeah. 70 times seven. You just keep forgiving. Now, if you look at Luke 17, verse three, uh, to your point there, Chris, you know, there, there, there are some conditions to forgiveness. Um, you know, we, we have to have that attitude of wanting to forgive, right? We, 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 we want to forgive someone who has sinned against us. We don't want to hold that grudge. We don't want to hold that, uh, um, you know, that resentment or seek that revenge. Uh, but we cannot ignore sin either. Uh, and that's, that's what some people try to lump forgiveness and mercy and say, well, if I want to forgive them, I just want to ignore their sin and just let it go. We can't do that either. Uh, And in in Luke chapter 17, uh, verse one, it says, he said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea that that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. I mean, that little word, if, holds a big meaning there, right? There's, there shows that there's some uh, uh, credentials. That's not quite the word I'm looking for. But, you know, has to be, this forgiveness has to be qualified. You cannot just ignore sin. He said to rebuke your brother if he sins against you. Uh, and if he repents... Then he says, you better be forgiven him. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's very important that we have that attitude that we want to forgive in spite of what they've done to us. Um, I mean, I've seen some real beautiful uh, scenes in the courtroom, right? I, a couple of years ago, there was that viral video that went around where uh, there was this uh, great demonstration of, of forgiveness and and I think maybe this guy might have murdered or something and and I, I can't remember the story but you see them embracing each other and and you you can see that forgiveness because obviously the one guy repented doesn't mean that he's going to escape his consequence of sin but at least the other the offended party was able to forgive uh, and embrace uh, the the offender, <laughs> you know, and 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 that's a huge thing. That is huge, uh, and it's hard to do. It is hard to do. I think that's what but, a lot of people struggle with, though. Yeah, you know, people struggle with the emotional aspect of all of this, yeah, because right. we all we do we do want to do this. I'm not saying it's not wrong to do, but we attach 
uh, feelings of emotion with forgiveness and mercy. Right. Um, but that I got to be realistic. That's not always going to happen. Hmm. You know, Jesus said, love your enemies. And then what did he say? He said, how to love your enemies is by doing good for them. Right. Um, you know, it's an act. It's an action. Hmm. Um, forgiving somebody is an action. Uh, f- f- being merciful to somebody is actually an action. And quite frankly, it's not always going to be based upon how I feel. Um, now I should, I should curb my feelings. I should learn to have more of an emotional, you know, love and attitude of forgiveness. I'm not denying that. Uh, I'm just saying sometimes we put too much of a struggle on ourselves and we don't know how to forgive because we don't feel like forgiving our enemies. Mm-hmm. And because we still have that, that feeling of animosity, uh, there, we still have that feeling of hurt. Well, you know, sometimes those feelings are not going to go away. The feelings of hurt are not going to go away. Uh, God grieved over the rebellious nature of his people, but then he gave them through an act of mercy, an opportunity to repent and come to him. That's what all the prophets are about. If you think about it, it was about judgment upon them, but it was about, this is what I'm going to do for you after that judgment. This is about bringing you through it. And this is about reestablishing you as my people. And then we can get to the feely stuff later. Mm. We can get to that, that heartfelt stuff later because it's out of love. And, and I, I have a hard time helping people understand that distinction because I just don't feel it. Well, I, I get that. And um, yeah. it's not a cold hearted religion. We don't have a cold hearted God, um, but we'll never get the feeling about something until we actually start to do that something. Mm-hmm. until we start to apply ourselves it's like the old adage try it you'll like it you know offer somebody a, uh you know a, a meal <laughs> i don't like that kind of food have you ever tried it i've, I've gotten that all my there's certain vegetables i don't like and i've had people tell me all the time have you ever tried it and i'll be like well no but i just know i don't <laughs> like it well no so they call me out on it how do yeah. you know unless you try it all right yeah so the my last thought is found in james chapter two uh, where in beginning there in verse eight, he says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you, you love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point he is guilty of all. Uh, and if you jump down just a little bit there in verse um, 12, he says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mm. Mercy triumphs over judgment and remember that's that's from the perspective of god that's also from our perspective to others because we are that extension of god toward uh, uh, towards others exactly and a lot of times people aren't going to see god unless they see it in his people because people don't look for god in the scripture they should and that's where you're going to find god uh, eventually and ultimately and you know people need to see god in us and if they see it in our attitude of mercy toward one another, of forgiveness, even when the world is saying, no, take vengeance, and we do not, that's going to have an effect on them. And they're going to see how the gospel works. And, um, you know, I, I want to leave you with this passage in Colossians 3, verses 12 to 13. that says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So who's our, who's our perfect example to follow? And that's Jesus the Christ. of Jesus Christ. Yeah. He is our Savior, and he did all these things to redeem us, and to pay that price that we can have a hope of eternal salvation. Well, good to be back with you, Nick, today. I hope you have a good week ahead. A lot of people are fighting sickness and, and all, mm-hmm. and just the season, I guess, once we start getting together with families and such, we start to share those germs, and <laughs> I know I've got it right now, so I'm hoping to be well by, by tomorrow. If not, we're going to continue with God's worship and praise to his name. We hope you'll join us at Northside at 9 o'clock at 689 North Main Street. If you're in the Morgantown area, go see Nick over at Christian Home off of Lovely Road. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Have a wonderful day. May God bless you in your week ahead.
Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name.